You've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting your Black Man with a Gun Show podcast. You know, the love of shooting sports and the Second Amendment serves to unite all people of all backgrounds, colors, creeds, and skill levels. This community is getting more diverse. But this week, I want to take this podcast and give you some background so that you can fight the people who are anti-rights. I don't know if you can handle what I'm about to give you, but if you stay to the end, if you stay, this is going to start one hell of a conversation. Blackmanwithagun.com, Ken Blanchard's pro-gun podcast. This week, I had a whole bunch of stuff swirling around in my little head, and uh, I was stuck. So I asked you on Facebook, my Facebook friends, what should I talk about? And man, did you come through. You got some stuff for me, so I got some studying to do, and I'll be bringing up some good stuff here shortly because of you. But this week, Yehuda and Pablo, you inspired this week's show. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At the time of this recording, most of my friends are at the National Rifle Association's annual meeting in Indiana. So since there's nobody around, just you and me, I want to talk about something that nobody talks about. You ready? Blacks and Jews. Racism. As a gun rights activist, there are 10 things that always come up of why people are anti-rights about our guns. 10 things that we share, both black, Jew, white, no matter what you are. No matter what you identify with, there's 10 things that are common. This goes far beyond magazine capacities and the latest firearm. This goes deep into America. The following program is intended for mature audiences. Are you still with me? You see, we live in the 21st century at the time of this recording. As jacked up as it is right now. We live in a computer age, the digital age. There's been a rapid shift from traditional industry that the Industrial Revolution brought through industrialization to what we have now, an economy based on informational technology. You can do all kinds of things. You can communicate with people around the world. This podcast is reaching around the world. But you know what hasn't changed that much? Our humanity. Our maturity our understanding of all the cultures. We have the opportunity right now to live better than we ever lived in our lives, and we still resort back to the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s in our thinking, and some even further back than that. After I got started in gun rights, after I got into firearms instruction, teaching different people, different groups, I started learning about other cultures that were also struggling with the gun question, with the gun community, with this thing we call the right to keep and bear arms. The Second Amendment, the U.S. Constitution, it had existed long before any of us were even born. But we still revert back. One of my first online friends and mentors was a guy by the name of Aaron Zellman. You may have never heard of his name before, but he created the Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. He started his group a few years before I got into it. It was in his infancy when I got started. But this dude was hardcore. He was a Navy corpsman back in the day, back in Nam. If you're a Marine, you know that Navy corpsman docks always got us out of trouble. Well, Aaron wanted me to be more confrontational. He wanted me to be in your face. And that wasn't me 30 years ago. Like everybody else, you have to learn at your own speed, your own pace. But with the advent and the invention of the internet, the podcasting podosphere, I am able to communicate from my basement. I'm able to talk to you where you are. And I want to share with you something that another Jewish friend of mine wrote, Rabbi David Ben-Dori. 
He's a rabbinic director for the Jews for the preservation of firearms ownership. He and his partner, author Alan Corwin of GunLaws.com, wrote a paper, which I want to share with you right now. In my short span of life here on this earth, I have seen so many similarities between the Jewish people and the African diaspora that blows my mind every day. But yet there are still people of color that allow others to influence how they think and speak and also put a wedge between others, white, black, all that good stuff, which is unnecessary. It keeps us fighting the wrong enemy. In September 1949, the 84-year-old African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois visited the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto. He said, I have seen something of human upheaval in the world, he wrote, but nothing in my wildest imagination was equal to what I saw in Warsaw in 1949. In 1903, Du Bois famously declared that, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. But after gaining first-hand knowledge of the destruction of Polish Jewry, more than four decades later, Du Bois readjusted his understanding of race in America. He began to see that slavery and racism were not, as he had long thought, a separate and unique phenomenon, but part of a larger problem of perverted teaching of human hate and prejudice. While allowing that racial oppression function even beyond the color line, Du Bois was careful not to posit a symmetry between the Jewish and black experiences. Rather, he argued for the understanding of the asymmetrically bit of it of history. Each group's experience was historically distinct and was neither entirely unique nor reducible to a universalized, a temporal narrative of common suffering. Du Bois or Du Bois argued that the particular and the universal needed to be held together in suspension. Since Du Bois conceived the color line's boundaries, he now saw racism and oppression as relational principles rather than fixed social categories. Only by understanding the multidirectional nature of structural injustice could equality be overcome. Anti-Semitism has no place in this community. As I've traveled this world, I've found out that there are so many similarities between cultures that we all got something wrong. All of us. You still with me? It's no secret that one of the largest blocks of people pressing for so-called gun control are the American Jews and the African Americans. Now, this would confound many of you on Instagram today because you don't see it. But it's a history. In reaction to the Holocaust, American Jews adopted the phrase never again. If actions mean anything, they don't believe it. That's for someone else to do. How did Jews expect to put teeth behind the words never again, if not with the ability to apply and project personal force when righteous and necessary for survival? Let's go for black people as well. Why then do so many people hate guns and fear gun ownership so much? Believe it or not, as soon as you buy your first firearm, you become a part of the gun rights movement. You may have never debated or testified or stood in a council or heard the craziness that's going to come out from the people who you thought were all right. Let me give you 10 themes shared by both Jews, blacks, and most anti-gun people in the world. The first is a desire for utopian moral purity. Number two, a disproportional incidence of the fear of guns or hoplophobia. A quest for power through victimization of peers. Four, a utopian delusion that if guns would just go away, crime would end and the world would be a peaceful, safe place. Number five, a self-hatred and a wish to be helpless, acting out guilt-based behavior problems that develop early in their childhood. Six, the ostrich syndrome. Seven, just plain old hypocrisy. Number eight, they throw religion in there. For Jews, it's Jews and names only. For Christians, for black people, Jesus wouldn't do that. But neither either know their history or scripture. Number nine would be feel good lying. Just an argument is just flat out wrong. Or if you want to get a good word for the day, sophistry. And number 10, an abject fear that yields to irrational behavior. Those are the 10. 
My brother, the rabbi, and Alan says, despite the modern American Jewish aversion to arms, it has not always been so. And Israeli Jews certainly understand the value of arms. Throughout history, there were Jews who fought in defense of their people and the way of life. The Torah is filled with Jews who took up arms in righteous and valiant defensive actions. When Abraham heard that his nephew Lot was taken captive, he took the 318 trained soldiers of his house and pursued the captives, defeated them, brought back Lot, and exacted retribution with their looted property, according to Genesis 14.14. And that's out of the Old Testament, baby. But wait, there's more. Contemporary Jews may have largely acquiesced to their World War II inquisitors, but biblical Jews resisted their Egyptian slave masters and then fought countless fierce battles against invaders, anti-Semites, such as the Amaleks, the Philistines, and Haman. Jews have been assaulted, accosted, and oppressed by nearly every nation and empire in history, including the ancient Greeks, Romans, Persians, Byzantines, Ottomans, and of course, modern nations like Germany and the USSR. And to all my brothers and sisters who descended from the west coast of Africa, now living in America. I don't have to go into detail about what happened to us, or do I? From history alone, you would think that these two groups, blacks and Jews, would be the most pro-gun people in America. But it ain't so, is it? And here's the funny part. It's our white brothers and sisters that sometimes have to teach us our own history. Yeah, I said it. James Brown said it best. We're people. We like the birds and the bees. We'd rather die on our feet than be living on our knees. Everybody want that utopian moral purity, but they reject the use of force. And by its very nature, force corrupts and polarizes. With power and force comes allies and adversaries. Taking sides, even righteous sides, conflicts with utopian egalitarianism. And as the phrase indicates, these utopian ideas are unattainable. Although such a rejection of personal power and righteous use of force seems irrational, especially for groups repeatedly murdered by governments and threatened by annihilation, it is a choice they are free to make. Using diverse strategies, Jews have survived every attempt to exterminate them while their tormentors have vanished. In Mark Twain's classic words, the Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. We must remind ourselves that Twain wrote this well before the Holocaust. Would his words have been different had he witnessed the government-run atrocities of the 20th century? The Torah and the Hebrew scripture, which we get the Old Testament, are sometimes full of violent texts that exhort followers to take up arms in many contexts and tell stories of vast militia and armed actions by the Jewish tribes. Many modern Jews and Christians alike ignore parts of the Bible and the Torah that they don't like. How about Esther 8, 15 through 9, 18, where Jews obliterate their enemies, and when asked what to do the next day, Esther says more of the same. And for good measure, impaled the ten killed sons of the evil vizier Haman on stakes. In place of this biblical claim to righteousness, use of force, contemporary American Jews and Christians have constructed a plain vanilla substitute. Or they just gloss over it and don't bring it up. Even that annual Passover, retelling of the escape from slavery in Egypt, glosses over the horrors of slavery and war to the point of a Grimm's fairy tale. Horrifying if you look at it literally and in full detail but diluted into a story safe for children, complete with drips of sweet wine to soften the gore and savagery. Before condemning, though, anybody for hypocrisy and forgetting their history, recognize that many religions similarly gloss over aspects of their sacred texts that don't mix well with their modern sensibilities. Aaron would have said that to me. How many biblical literalists cleave to the elements of, say, Leviticus with its calls of stoning certain women to death burning certain daughters, or instructions on how to manage your slaves. Uh, I know it's tight, but it's right. How about the disproportional incidence of the fear of guns, or hoplophobia, the irrational morbid fear of guns? It's a phrase, a word, coined in 1966 by Colonel Jeff Cooper from the Greek hoplites, which means weapons. And you can see his book, Principles of Personal Defense, 
that it may cause sweating, faintness, discomfort, rapid pulse, nausea, sleeplessness, nondescript fears, fantasizing, more, and mere thought of guns. Hoplophobia. Presence of working firearms may cause panic attack and the desperate effort at avoidance. Dr. Sarah Thompson, in her groundbreaking essay on the subject Raging Against Self-Defense, pointed out that hoplophobes often use the psychological defense mechanism of projection in dealing with their fear. Unable to, or unsure of their ability to control their own internal conflicts, they project their conflicts onto people around them. They fear losing control, going berserk, shooting people around them, or shooting themselves in a mad, chaotic expression of rage. And it's only natural for them to then assume that anyone else with a gun could or would do the same. And the occasional mad person, the active shooter, the crazy person, serves to reinforce that fear. And this explains, at last, the perpetual hysteria that proclaims every time a Second Amendment infringement is lifted, we will suffer shootouts at stoplights, slow waiters murdered on the spot, or Dodge City bloodshed as a result. Every new carry permit law, the repeal of the National Parks Possession Ban, the expired Clinton-era rifle bans, lifted restrictions for adult gun carries on campuses, all were met with the same barrage of irrational fears. It is a knee-jerk mantra, loudly shouted and then brazenly promoted by an unethical media every time. And the imagined fear? It never manifests. It is but an empty neurotic fantasy. Media corrections are never published, and so the fantasies and lies are repeated and recycled. Shame on those who would forever repeat the same absurd lies, never recant, and refuse to seek help for neurosis. We must show tolerance and understand. I know, facts mean little to people with morbid, irrational fears, but the fears just continue. Hoplophobes need treatment and sympathy, not laws infringing the body politic. Allen says some of what we think of as a political issue, so-called gun control, is actually a psychiatric condition, a medical problem. Victimization, number three. In our culture, victimization accords moral authority and thus power to the victim. Subjugating or convincing a constituency to accept victimization cedes power to those perpetuating these harmful ruse on their peers. This is despicably immoral but it is tacitly acceptable and all too commonplace in our victimization culture. Just think of how many, quote, rights organizations claim moral authority and power through victimization. Blacks have largely been convinced by their leaders to avoid guns. It's in music, notwithstanding, leaving them reliant who, on who the police really are, historically, often perceived poorly by our community. Who among American blacks trust police implicitly? Such trust may be irrational, but no one claims humans act irrationally at all, most of the time. The people know instinctively that they cannot trust government agents for their safety, yet they are left to wish for such protection. A near-perfect parallel exists with respect to Jews. Governments are historically the greatest threat to Jews, or anyone, responsible for horrendous mass murder campaigns and pogroms throughout history. Murder by government, democide, is by far the greatest killer of innocent human beings. People imbued with the intoxicated power of government authority exterminated 262 million people in the 20th century, according to political scientist R.J. Rummel. Murderous criminals don't hold a candle to the deadly threat government poses to the public. But yet our so-called Jewish and black leaders are the greatest anti-rights people there are and the strongest proponents for us to rely on government for safety and destroying the right of the individual to keep and bear arms. Somehow we're supposed to expect the police to protect us, a reliance that has failed all of us throughout history. I spoke about that in general last week. And if you haven't read it, check out a book called Dial 911 and Die by attorney Richard W. Stevens, written back in 1999. And the high court has uh, confirmed this many times, most recently as late as the Parkland shooting in Florida. Look it up. Number four, the utopian delusion that if guns would just, quote, go away, crime would end and the world would be a peaceful, safe place. The basic liberal tenet of faith has been around time immemorial and affects all of us in disproportionate numbers. We're fond of saying that if guns would just go away, the world would be a better place. We often fail to look back at history, 
to a time before guns existed and recalled the incredible savagery that took place without guns available for protection. Life back then was brutal and encouraged. Doom them to destruction. Grant them no quarter. And that's from Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 2. Believe it or not, our world bristling with arms is a more decent and safe place to live than the ancient world. People blind themselves to this reality and pop culture when it isn't promoting Hollywood-style machine gun silliness enforces the false notion that a total ban on guns would bring world peace. This utopian vision is supposedly supported by Isaiah's prophecy of the messianic future. Quote, when they shall beat their spears into pruning hooks, when the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Now, prophetic as it may be, but as instructions for living, it's a recipe for death and destruction, and both Jews and Christians alike are also instructed otherwise, but often prefer to ignore the inconvenient. Beat your plow short shares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong, according to Joel 4.9. Put down your arms in the face of a vicious enemy, and then you will suffer the fate of the lamb who lies down with the lion. Yeah. Often hold a dangerous related myth that violence never solves anything. Like so many platitudes, it is appealing with enormous first blush power, yet it is self-evidently preposterous. Any degree of thought spoils the sweet image. Hitler, Hezbollah, Haman, and other hordes are not stopped with peace marches, protest rallies, and clever signs. Can I get an amen, somebody? Despots are overthrown by force or the incredible threat of force. Brutal criminals bent on rape and murder are not held back by intellectual prowess or messianic visions. They are held back either by the brutal stopping power of a well-aimed bullet or by caging them when captured. It is the unfortunate reality of this harsh world. Countervailing force is the only deterrent for aggression. But we tend to reject this, and you're free to do so. But they also have no legitimate moral authority to drag anyone else into that legal tar pit with them. And some African-Americans and Jewish people hold the notion that weapons are unacceptable because violence is unacceptable. The fact that guns save lives, that guns stop crime, that guns protect you and guns are the reason Israel still stands are blocked out of any thought process. Also, I can just add in here free of charge, guns do not equate to murder. They would have you to believe and falsely believe that guns are designed for murder. Murder is illegal. Guns are properly designed for protection. Killing to protect is legal, moral, just, and virtually universally sanctioned. Deliberate misuse of guns by miscreants does not define guns. Number five, self-hatred and a wish to be helpless, acting out guilt-based behavioral problems that develop in childhood. My friend, the founder of Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership, the late Aaron Zellman, framed this succinctly with many Jews he met. They would express outrage at Aaron's classical approach of arming for safety, peace through strength, and deterrence as a means of achieving peace and stability, which is Israel's approach, though he didn't frame it in those terms. They would emphatically reject the idea that all Jews should be educated to arms and know how to handle and shoot guns for their own safety. He could see through, see through their self-righteous bluster and tell them, you're just a self-hating Jew waiting to sniff the gas. Aaron was off the chain, man. He was like, well, like me sometimes. Too early in the cause, a mountain man in the age of civilization. But this stuff is real, y'all. And you're going to face it today, tomorrow, as a gun rights activist. Number six is the ostrich syndrome. Some people are inherently weak-willed and live without a strong moral compass. Do you agree with that statement? These folks are eager to simplify their lives and avoid uncomfortable situations, unwilling to face the harsh realities of life. They would prefer to ignore guns and pretend the need for self-defense would go away if they just pay it no heed. It is irrational, yes, but understandable when you consider the psyche that generates such thinking. These people, Jews and Gentiles alike, will say stuff like, I don't believe in guns, as if they don't exist, or as if their purported non-belief makes the subject evaporate and obviates the possibility of encountering a situation in which self-defense is necessary. It's foolhardy, it's stupid, it's dangerous, but an ostrich with his head in the sand 
probably feels just fine until it is eaten. Number seven is our garden variety hypocrisy. You know, while many folks say they hate guns, they actually support guns. So long as the guns are in the hands of, quote, the proper authorities on a civil level today, that means the police. So in reality, the so-called anti-guns folks are really very pro-gun rights. They just want somebody else to hold the guns for them. And that's not only hypocritical, it's immoral. Attorney Jeff Snyder points out in his globally flame, famous book, famous book, yeah, Nation of Cowards, that expecting other people to risk their lives to save yours cannot be supported in a moral way. He says, if you believe it is reprehensible to possess the means and will use lethal force to repel a criminal assault, how can you call upon another to do so for you? And because that is his job and we pay him to do it, because your life is an incalculable value, but his is only worth the $30,000 yearly salary we pay him. He asks, is your life worth protecting? Whose responsibility is it to protect it? The full weight of his argument repeatedly comes back to personal responsibility. Number eight, adulterated religion, Jews in name only. Arizona-based historian Michael E. Newton, author of The Path to Tyranny, posits that part of the problem rests with Jews who no longer believe in Judaism and have placed their previous religion with a popular new one called social justice. If a biblically-based value system no longer drives protection of the God-given of gift of life, then abandoning the right to self-defense poses little moral dilemma. Jews who are only or barely culturally Jewish have little reason to rise up to the standards Jewish law speaks of explicitly. Like in the Talmud, it says, if a man comes to kill you, rise early and kill him first. Newton observes that in times of trouble, religious Jews offer prayers to God in the hope that he will help. That sounds like some Christians I know too. Secular Jews turn to the government instead of to protect and defend themselves. The Bible says, thou shalt not stand idly by the blood of thy neighbor. Not only can we defend our neighbor from attack in Torah law, we are commanded to do so. Rabbi says that we must also defend ourselves. It's so patently obvious in Jewish law that no defense or justification is given for it. Who is more religious? The secular Jew who believes government police forces will defend them or the religious Jew who trusts in God but also believes that God gave us the strength, right, and even the commandment to defend ourselves. The entire anti-rights issue on guns may be tangent to this perhaps larger issue. Number nine, feel-good sophistry. Feel-good sophistry is a rigid attachment to false arguments that have the effect of deceiving. It works for a lot of humanity, and it is a component of the Jewish mindset. People attach to ideas and concepts regardless of or despite any germ of validity, often based on emotion with no factual support. It is irrational and foolish, but people are free to be irrational and foolish. But then they vote and inject themselves into political arena. In doing so, they force humanity to deal not only with real problems, but the imaginary ones as well. In a Baptist church, this is when the preacher goes on a, a tirade about not having guns in the community, but secretly has a concealed weapons permit himself. Who knows, who's an educated man, who knows that the right to keep and bear arms is important for his life. But it's not necessarily for everybody else. He wants his congregation to feel good. So he repeats stuff that he knows isn't true. Because he wants to keep his congregation. Who are mostly women. But that's a whole other story. And finally, the abject fear that yields irrational behavior. Number 10 of the 10 things that you're going to encounter as a gun rights activist, as a person in the community that has always been around, whether you be black, white, pink, green, or orange, Jew, or Gentile, Roman, or Greek, it's always been around. The wild-eyed desire to take all the guns away ignores the fact that government is the intended agent for such a plan. Such a plan would not take away guns at all. It would merely transfer them, giving them all to government with the stark exception of entire arsenals already th or thoroughly banned yet in the hands of criminals and the enemies of the state. You know, in seeking this take away all the guns kind of thinking, folks 
disregard the fact that historically governments have been the main perpetrators of atrocities against them. They also ignore the fact that in times before guns, when physical protection was more difficult, violence was worse and more horrific than today. Think about Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Attila the Hun, Vlad the Impaler, in addition to uh, the obvious Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and uh, Joker from the Batman. And that's it. As King Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, third chapter, eighth verse, there is a time for war and a time for peace. If you want to read this entire article, whose credit it is definitely accredited to, it is by Rabbi David Bendori, the rabbinic director for Jews for the Preservation of Gun Ownership and a certified firearms instructor. Alan Corwin, author of nine books on gun laws. He's the publisher at Bloomfield Press and runs the national directory website, gunlaws.com. Think about supporting the Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. You can find them online at jpfo.org. Being an armed citizen means having a gun with you all the time. Carrying a firearm every day requires a holster that is both concealable and comfortable. Whether you choose our Super Tuck Deluxe or Mini Tuck, you'll have the confidence that comes from being discreetly and comfortably armed, prepared to face unforeseen dangers. Crossbreed holsters are handmade in the USA, come with a lifetime warranty and a two-week try-it-free guarantee. Order your holster today at CrossbreedHolsters.com. All right, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about what I said today. Hit me back at Black Man with a Gun 1 on Facebook, on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, a shout out to you out there. Um, or on the app, feel free to uh, hit me back on the app. You know, the app is free. It's paid for by 36 members of the uh, Patreon group. If you would be so kind, if you are not supporting me, Supporting the podcast, supporting where I'm trying to go. Don't know where I'm trying to go? Oh, man, I missed the opportunity to tell you. You see, a long time ago, I decided to not just be a YouTuber, not just be a gun rights activist, but be an American activist, a freedom activist, to be what Martin Luther King would do if he was on a podcast. I wanted to be for all people. Sometimes I hit the mark, sometimes I don't. And I'm trying, I'm really trying to grow my social media to be for everybody. I would love to have 10 writers on Black Man with a Gun, YouTubers, vloggers, bloggers, you know, folks that contribute, that they have blogs of their own, of course, but they know that being associated with me is not a bad thing that I've been around a minute, that my website might have a bit more traffic than yours, has a little bit more um, Google juice. It could be stronger together. That we could make something like the Huntington Post, um, kind of like Amoland.com also. Um, but it could be different because it's you and me. We have the opportunity. We have the same opportunity for this podcast, for everything I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it more than just me. But folks not used to that. they they still trying to swim upstream and skate uphill. Still trying to do it by themselves. Not a lot of togetherness, but I'm trying. In my old age, I'm still trying. And the Patreon account that I started helps with that. It allows me to try new platforms, to branch out, to do more Second Amendment activism for everybody. That's what it's about. If you're interested, if you would like to be a part of of my community, I mean, really a part. Hit me, hit me up. If all you can do is support me financially, that is greatly appreciated because I would not be this far, this long in the in the way, without money. Way back in the day, I went crazy. I went balls to the walls. I spent every money, every, all the money I had, trying to get this thing started. I blew money like nobody's business. I bankrupted my family. I almost got kicked out of my house. It's a long story. But the long and the short of it is all the money that I make online is my money. And all my money is the money I use for the Second Amendment, for gun rights activism, for whatever. So no more house money goes into this stuff. That's the rule that I made and uh, not breaking it. 
So sometimes I don't get a chance to travel because it's not in the not in the budget. But folks like you, it's like 36 folks right now. Help me with Patreon. Help me by buying keychains, books, patches, whatever I got out here. You're helping the cause. You're helping me help other people. Patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. And I'm not going to beat a dead horse. You know what I'm saying. If you'd like to be one of the Patreons, one of the ones who supports our movement, please give today. Saw a couple of questions on Facebook on which uh, defense insurance company you should buy. I am partial to the United States Concealed Carry Association. If you carry a gun for self-defense, be smarter and join the United States Concealed Carry Association so you can be covered in case you have to use the thing to protect your life from the judicial system. Upfront bail bond funding, attorney counseling, personal hardship coverage, membership deals and discounts, firearms theft liability coverage, and more. Go to uscca.blackmanwithagun.com right now. uscca.blackmanwithagun.com And I do get financial compensation if you use my link. So help a brother out and help yourself at the same time. Now, you know that song that you heard um, right before I started, uh, Hava Nagila? Well, it's um, an old Yiddish word or phrase or song that means let's rejoice. It's um, used in parties and bar mitzvahs. And if I can leave you with any thought this week, let us celebrate something. Celebrate life. Let's celebrate hard work. You know, it doesn't guarantee success, but it does definitely improves our chances. To life or La kind. Well, that's a wrap for this week. And remember, whether you be Jew or Gentile, I love you. And it's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next time. Shalom, baby. To keep in touch with Ken and his cause, head over to blackmanwithagun.com. Blanchard.media.